we um, have uh, um, a, a particular issue, I think, with complex systems that almost nobody discusses as such. And uh, over the years, I've been particularly interested in the food and farming system because I've come to see it as by far and away the greatest of the threats to the living planet. It's, it's the one we talk about um, less than almost any other because, well, it's surrounded by a kind of moral force field. We don't want to go there. We don't want to criticise farmers. We all have to eat. Um, it's much easier to criticise, and as we rightly do, the oil and gas industry or the plastics industry or the mining industry. Um, and, you know, and, and I don't for a moment say we shouldn't do those things, but we don't apply the same standards to the industry with the greatest environmental impact of all, which is food and farming. Um, and we are almost entirely um, ignorant of the complex dynamics within that system, the, food, the global food system, and the potential dangers which, which those pose. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, in researching Re Regenesis, my, my latest book, um, I read over 5,000 scientific papers, uh, and a lot of them were terrifying. I mean, there's a lot to be deeply scared about when it comes to uh, both the humanitarian aspects and the environmental aspects of the food system and how it is evolving. Um, devastating to Earth systems, but also um, uh, great threats to our ability to continue to feed ourselves. But of those over 5,000 papers, the, the most frightening of all that I read was a series of papers going back about 10 years, saying the food system is beginning to look rather like the financial system in the approach to 2008. Um, and those papers, um, some of them are very detailed. Um, there's a great deal of evidence which they bring to bear. Um, they, uh, as in all scientific papers, of course, they refer back to others, they're cited in, uh, by, by others which come later, but they never break the surface. And there's almost no contact between what the scientists are saying about the food system and what uh, then the discussions that we have about the food system in public life. Um, the, those, that series of papers has been entirely ignored by politicians and the media. We just don't talk about their findings. And yet the findings are deeply alarming because what they show is a loss of systemic resilience in the global food system. That is the, the growing of food, the harvesting of food, the processing, the wholesaling, the retailing, the distribution, the whole global food system. A loss of systemic resilience, which is strikingly similar in some respects to the loss of systemic resilience we saw in the global financial system in the 2000s. Um, and as with the global financial system, we've seen certain nodes become very big, in fact, super dominant. Um, in finance, it was the banks. In, um, in the food system, it's the very large corporations which control a really frightening proportion of that system. To give one example, um, just four corporations and one estimate control 90% of the global grain trade. Um, and we see the links between those nodes becoming ever stronger. And um, the um, food system is losing critical elements of systemic resilience. It's been losing diversity. It's been losing asynchronicity been losing redundancy, modularity, circuit breakers, and backup systems. All of those have been systemically um, stripped out, partly by corporate strategies and partly by the sort of evolving consolidation and homogenization that you see in, in a lot of human-made systems um, as we all sort of head towards similar products and similar standards. In fact, um, some um, food experts talk of the development of a global standard diet, um, where, whereas uh, a generation or two ago, people often had very distinctive diets, which varied greatly from one nation to another, or even from one valley to another. And those diets reflected the, the local farming practices, and the farming practices reflected the diets. 
And people's diets were often not good ones. In fact, they were very often highly deficient in, in, in crucial nutrients. Um, and they, they might have been very sparse in terms of calories as well and, and quite bland and boring often. But they were markedly different from one place to, a, to another. What we see with the um, consolidation of the global standard diet is that our diets have become locally more diverse but globally less diverse. So if you walk into your local supermarket, you will see a variety of food which your grandparents could not have dreamt of. Just extraordinary range of stuff brought in from all over the world. And I'm not saying that's innately a bad thing. It's, it's really not. You know, we can have much healthier and better and richer and more diverse diets. And actually, with uh, uh, potentially no greater environmental cost, and, and, and if we choose carefully, a much lower environmental cost because actually food miles is a very, very small component of the overall um, um, environmental damage done by what we eat. The, the, the content of our diet is much more important than, than where it comes from. But the, the striking feature is that if you were to walk into a supermarket on the other side of the world, it would have an almost identical range of products. It would be more or less the same stuff and often being sold to you by the same people. If you trace the, the chain back far enough, you'll find that the local subsidiary is actually part of the same corporation whose local subsidiary is selling you the same product here in the UK. Um, and, and, and that in turn has um, driven the development of the global standard farm, which then feeds back into the global standard diet, whereby everyone is, well, not everyone, but you know, a huge proportion of the world's farmland is being farmed using the same machinery, the same chemicals, uh, the same techniques, and even the same seeds. So for instance, we've seen a 75% loss in um, crop plant diversity, the genetic diversity of crop plants since 1900. And we see this tremendous focus on a few very successful cultivars, crop varieties. Um, and this makes them very susceptible uh, to, to disruption. Um, for example, there's a wheat stem fungus called UG99, which is now raging across Africa and Asia because there's so little genetic diversity within wheat that once it's honed in on the dominant varieties, then it can just sweep unimpeded um, across vast distances. Um, and we see the same with the um, development of, of herbicide resistant super weeds because everyone's using the same herbicides and at the same stage of crop growth. Um, and, and so um, while the individual companies are pursuing what appear to be rational policies, they're actually destabilizing the, 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 the global food system as, as a whole. And this is particularly the case with the increase in, in the network density of the system as, as the corporations become integrated with each other, integrated with the financial system, integrated with the IT system, in ways that are often quite opaque just as the development of the difficulties in the financial system were with the securitization and the derivatives trading, most people actually hadn't a clue what was going on, including some of the people who were doing it. Um, and, and what we, we're seeing is the synchronization of corporate strategies. You know, they've, they've hit the profit formula and now they're all doing the same thing. And when an innovation comes in, uh, they're all, uh, they all adopt that innovation. And, you don't need many people to do that because it's so tremendously concentrated, more so, in fact, than the financial system was and, and is. Um, and of course, um, by pursuing their efficiencies, they strip the, the redundancy out of the system. Um, the diversity, well, we've already talked about that. The modularity of the system, tearing down the, 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 the walls um, between um, different nations, different valleys, and the rest of it, that's already very well advanced. Through very intense and focused corporate lobbying, they've torn down a lot of the circuit breakers, the regulatory breaks upon the system, um, which, which can stop it from, from synchronizing dangerously. And we're seeing a, a very rapid collapse in backup systems, in alternative means of producing our food. Um, and 
at the same time, we see a great uh, polarization around the world into um, countries which are super exporters and countries which are super importers. There's been a massive increase in the number of people who are uh, dependent on global trade, um, uh, global food trade for their survival. Um, and again, I'm not dissing global trade. I mean, up to a certain point, global food trade makes a, um, a, 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 a national food market more resilient, because if you have a local crop failure, um, that, that, that you're not going to starve if you're able to import food from elsewhere. But if you are fully integrated into a system which is losing its resilience and stability, then you could find yourself in quite a parlous state. And, and you know, while, while um, countries and companies have been merrily pursuing integration, there's been almost no discussion at all of the global systemic consequences of, of that pursuit. And so we see this extraordinary um, 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 polarization of exporters and importers. Um, in, in just 18 years, the number of trade connections between exporters and importers of wheat, for instance, have doubled. Um, and the same applies to rice. Um, we see now just, uh, what is it, four countries harvesting 76% of the maize exported to other nations, five selling 77% of the rice, uh, five supplying 65% of the wheat, um, three nations supplying 86% of the world's soybeans, which in turn provide three quarters of the world's feed for farm animals. Um, and, and, and so we, we, we're seeing this, this great consolidation and homogenization going, uh, taking place. But it's also the case that a lot of this food has to pass through some very narrow choke points. Um, over half um, the world's cereals and soy um, passes through um, these, these very narrow, tight and vulnerable shipping lanes, such as um, the, the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, the Straits of Hormuz, the Bab al-Mandab, the Turkish Straits, the Straits of Malacca. Um, and it doesn't take much of a disruption for one or more of those choke points to be closed. So if you um, think back to 2021, that um, big uh, um, container ship, the Ever Given, got wedged across the Suez Canal. And luckily, they managed to lift it out in a few days um, um, by, by digging around it. But if they hadn't been able to do that, and for a while it looked as if they wouldn't, they would have had to unload the whole ship. Um, on the banks of the canal, and that would have taken weeks. Had that disruption coincided with the closure of the Turkish Straits by Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, then for hundreds of millions of people, the food chain might simply have snapped. The, um, uh, the, the shelves would, would have cleared because large numbers of people, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, are highly dependent on the grain that passes through uh, either or both of the Turkish Straits and, and the Suez Canal. Um, and, and so we can see all these vulnerable vulnerabilities within the system as a whole. And it's arguable that the greatest threat to the global food system is the global food system. But bearing upon this system are a whole series of external pressures. And if that system has lost its resilience and instead of damping down stress, damping down shocks which are transmitted through the network, it amplifies those shocks as negative feedback loops turn to positive feedback loops. And you can see we could be in a very dangerous situation indeed. And, and this system is being hit very hard by environmental shocks already. So, and, and in fact, sometimes those environmental shocks coincide with geopolitical shocks. So if we think back to last year, soon after the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and both Russia and Ukraine are, are, are among those four or five nations which produce much of the world's grain. Um, so soon after that in, invasion took place and um, um, we saw the price of wheat spiking because Ukraine's wheat and indeed um, su sunflower oil production, also that spike, um, um, were, were effectively cut off by that invasion. The Indian government stepped forward and said, don't worry about wheat exports because we've got a record harvest on the way 
and um, we'll be able to fill in any gaps which have been left by the invasion of Ukraine. Just a month later, the Indian government came forward again and said, uh, about that, those exports, we've decided to impose an export ban on wheat because we've been hit by this massive heat wave, which has shriveled the grain on the crops. And, and instead of having a record harvest, we've got almost a record low harvest. It's been a total disaster. And we're seeing these environmental shocks hitting the global food system at greater and greater frequency and intensity. The shocks of drought, the shocks of floods, wildfires, fire, um, of cyclones, of hurricanes. Uh, we're seeing a general drying out, a reduction in soil moisture across very large parts of the planet. Um, we um, are, are seeing um, um, uh, very serious impacts on irrigation water in particular. And in fact, much of the projection of yield increases depends on irrigation water, which simply does not exist because it's already maxed out. Um, and, and then major impacts uh, caused by soil erosion and degradation, um, a, a whole series of either chronic or acute problems caused by in, 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 in environmental shocks, uh, which, which are likely only to, to increase. And, and so there are plenty of potential nudges which could push this this system which has become a fragile system over its its crucial threshold and could tip it um, and of course as with any system you can never know which particular nudge it could be but there there, there are plenty of of potential dangers here and this loss of resilience coupled with the escalating series of shocks hitting the system could explain an otherwise inexplicable trend, which is as follows, that up until 2014, there was a lot of optimism amongst global food experts that we were actually going to um, fulfill UN Sustainable Development Goal 2.1, which was an end to global hunger by 2030. We'd seen a pretty consistent trend since the 1960s, right the way to 2014, of a decline in global chronic hunger. But in 2015, the trend began to turn and we saw a slight uptick in hunger, which has continued ever since and has become steeper and steeper. Now, you know, we're aware of the impacts of COVID on the global food system. We're aware of, of the impacts of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global food system. But this trend began long before. It began in 2015 and, and the really, peculiar thing about that was that at the time grain harvests were very high and the global food index which is the 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 average price global price was um uh, uh was uh, historically low in fact it fell between 2015 uh, 2014 and 2015 from 115 to 93 um and any economist will tell you well if food prices are lower fewer people will go hungry right simple but just as, as food prices were falling and pretty steeply, global hunger began to rise. And what seems to have happened then and has been happening ever since is that as shocks hitting the system are amplified across that system, the countries they land on are the poorest ones. The ones with weak currencies trying to buy food in, in, on hard currency markets, the ones which stand at the end of the queue. And, and as a shock caused by a relatively minor incident, such as a speculative surge on one commodity or an export ban by one nation, um, as those are amplified across the system rather than damped down across the system, they can land with great force on some of the poorest nations. And local food prices can spike even as global food prices remain low. And until COVID, we, we in the rich nations were completely unaware of this. We were immune to it. It didn't affect us. And we just complacently assumed that the trend of declining chronic hunger was continuing. Um, and it's only been recently that people have woken up and say, oh, that's something funny is going on here. What could this possibly be? And I think the only parsimonious explanation of it is declining systemic resilience. Now, this is a fantastically dangerous situation. 
And had the global financial system gone down, it would have caused major and cascading impacts for many of the world's people. But if the global food system goes down, well, we're looking at a completely different scale of impact. Rich people will eat, nobody else will. That, that, that's the way it will work out. And while governments were able to step in at the 11th hour to rescue the global financial system by generating future money, you can't bail out the global food system by inventing future food. So we need urgent action now, and the action has to start with alerting policymakers, the media, professionals uh, in many different fields um, to the, the very poignant warnings in the scientific literature, which simply have not escaped from the scientific literature. And the sense I have when I'm reading these papers is, is of the scientists trapped behind a sheet of plate gl glass and, and, and you can see them hammering on the glass and you can see their lips moving, but you can't hear what they're saying. And we need to hear it. We urgently need to hear this. And, and we need to address this issue as we would any other comparable complex system by reintroducing those elements of systemic resilience, bringing back diversity, asynchronicity, redundancy, modularity, circuit breakers, backup systems. Um, and there's a lot of interesting ways in which that can be done without sacrificing our global trade system, which could be beneficial if it's used, if it's used in, in a clever and responsible way, but can accelerate disaster if it's used in the way that, that dominates today. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, so, I mean, um, you don't need to plug the book. I've, I've, I've read the book. It's, it's, it's excellent. And But one thing that I'm shocked by in it is just how much we kind of have data and information and some knowledge about the situation, but how little that the, the situation changes. Yeah. And Robin Stoll asked a question in the chat sort of about halfway through, which I think is a really interesting one to ask you which is around sources of motivation for change, who's in control, what information skills are needed, and who should be involved to make such change succeed? And I think those are blooming good questions to actually yes. asking at this point. Yeah, no, they're all they're all excellent questions. And, and you know, this, this is part of the problem. Now, you know, I don't want to suggest that the problem is only information deficit, because as we've seen from the Home Secretary's remarks just today, doesn't matter how well informed you are, if you if you deny the role of experts and and suggest that they're your enemy, then um, um, you, you're not going to learn anything, and and nothing positive is going to change. And you know it's it's obviously not just a lack of information we're facing here. There's massive denial. There's um, the corporate interests. There's financial interests in sustaining a system which works for them, but actually might not work. Um, for anyone else or even for them in, 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 in the long run. And we're up against very powerful forces here, just as we were with global finance. And you know, we have to accept this a harsh reality that if governments had tried to step in in 2006 or 2007 um, to um, prevent financial collapse at that stage, which would have been a much better a, a point at which to step in and would have been much cheaper, and, and much easier um, in, 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 in systemic terms and in economic terms, they would have faced massive political resistance from the banks which had developed all these exotic financial instruments, all their collateralized debt obligations and securities and derivatives and all the rest of it, and were doing very nicely, thank you very much, with their enormous bonuses arising from them. Um, they would have created a huge political fuss to say, who are these interfering bureaucrats stopping the free market from operating? Um, they're undermining our prosperity by doing so. Um, whereas, you know, as we subsequently find out, they undermined our prosperity by not doing so. And, and so, you know, we're, we're up against a propaganda system. It's a propaganda system which can be broadly described as capitalism. Uh, and it's very well defended. And if you challenge any aspect of it at all, even if you say, well, can we just tweak this little bit here? 
you find yourself up against a brick wall of of denial, of pushback, of anger, um, of, of people who just don't want to hear what you've got to say. So yeah, you know, part of it is we need to get the information out there. There is definitely an information deficit, and no question about that. You know, and and, and that lack of contact between the academic world and and the rest of public life is is very disturbing in a whole series of of subjects but on this one perhaps more dangerous almost than on any other um, but it's not just about that we also need to get political we need to combine we need to campaign we need to mobilize in the way that you know our our forebears understood and we aren't seem to understand much less these days because we've been very successfully persuaded that we're consumers rather than citizens Mm. Thanks, George. Patrick, your hand is raised. Would you like to ask your question? Um, it, it, it was thanks, Tony. It was it was kind of less of a question and more more an observation, and and perhaps um, speaks to a, a you know a, a guy that Martin Reynolds is more familiar with, which is uh, C. West Churchman, who um, after the limits to growth came out, wrote a, was sort of stunned by the same sorts of um, non-reaction as you've commented on George and he wrote a book the um the enemies of of the uh, systems approach mm -hmm. so the four he named if I can remember them now were uh and Martin will chip in if I can't I hope uh, and bail me out um were politics um aesthetics religion mm -hmm. and I can't remember what the fourth one was but I mean the, the, basically the argument was People coming from a having a different worldview simply don't hear mm. the the arguments made from a systems point of view, mm. and the politics one was was an enemy because basically politics is the art of what people you know it's it's the Overton window it's what people will let you get away with mm. if that's if that's how you see the world then anything outside the Overton window is nuts. Mm, and yeah. we are outside you know this this is an argument outside the Overton window so it's yeah. nuts mm, and yeah. it is it is inconceivable to to people coming at it with a political mindset for the simple reason that if they argue it then then they get they're no longer politicians they're out on the rear yeah. um and so i think i think the you know the the finding how to do this is 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 um a much more is in its you know, it's not just the technical issue of, of sustainability. It's the, it's the how we get the arguments across in a way that 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 actually lands, uh, and that in itself is is a is a problem, which you kind of can't do the political way because the politics mm. is part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I, mm. I, I don't have a good answer to that, but I mean, it's it's um, it's a non-triv problem, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, I'm very glad you raised all that. Um, I'm particularly interested and intrigued by the inclusion of aesthetics there because I bump against this big time when it comes to food. You know, when, when it comes to food issues, it's all about the pictures and not about the numbers. You know, all, as a population, we are woefully food enumerate. We just don't understand what can scale and what can't scale. So you get these sort of food writers say, oh, everyone should eat pasture fed meat. Well, that would be great if we had several planets and no space for wild ecosystems on any of them. Mm. But you know, it just doesn't add up. There was a study in the US showing um, that if you were to take the foodie advice to switch from corn-fed beef, which is bad enough, to pasture-fed beef, you'd have to increase the land area used for cattle keeping by 270%. The whole of the United States would have to be a cattle ranch and you'd still be importing beef from Brazil. Um, and But people say, oh, but I like the look of cows in the field. So that's what we should all have. That's what we should all eat. And so let's have a Neolithic production system feeding a 21st century population. Um, and aesthetics, uh, I'm so glad that's included because it's, it's a huge pillar of, of, of rational and sustainable thinking. And, and, and just as in the climate movement, you know, we've learned to do the maths uh, or do the math as it originally was, because it was in the United States that that campaign began, you know, to understand how much fossil fuel you can burn if you want to stay under a certain temperature limit, how much has to be left in the ground. We urgently need to do that with food and, of course, with every other subject as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, George. Uh, John Waters, your hand is raised and you'd like to ask a question. Do you want to go ahead? <laughs> 
Well, not so much a question, just just uh, uh, throwing a comment. Um, this is very timely. It it relates very strongly to a workshop I'll be facilitating next month at the Metaforum conference. Uh, it's rather ambitiously about global viability, but it it's 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 looking at ways of getting information to where it's needed, creating feedback loops from the planetary to human scale. But I just wanted to throw in an observation. Well, some, I was speaking to somebody a couple of days ago. He told me that Stafford Beer had told him that there was no instance of a failing company that he'd ever observed, which wasn't due to a massive failure of the interaction between systems three and four, the inside and now, and the outside and then. Now, this is supposed to be brought into harmony under the supervision of system five, the ethos. But I'm going to I'm going to stick my neck out and extend this from the company level to the planetary level. I think we have a, a planetary scale problem where system three entirely dominates system four and system five, which is catastrophic for any system. People might balk at my uh, playing fast and loose with these terms, but I think it's I think this is what's happening here. Thank you, um, John. I, I find that very interesting. I'm not qualified to comment on it, but um, I'd, I'd love to learn more about um, about that perspective. Thank you. Um, thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Sam, would you like to go ahead, please? You might need to take yourself off mute, Sam. Hello. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, so uh, I read, well, it's a little bit depressing hearing all about it. <laughs> um, but I guess like on a wide, like you were talking about the politics and the wider system change, it feels like there's no <clears throat> sort of answer on that level other than sort of, you know, emailing your MP or whatever. But I guess I read a book by Cormac Russell called Rekindling Democracy. It's all about how communities coming together can make a difference. So I suppose my question would be, what is from your perspective, what can a community do is a tangible sort of, you know, can influence because that, that's sort of what my, I do as a job. So it'd be interesting to hear that. Thanks. Well, that's another great question and, and really interesting, I think, from a systems perspective, because, of course, society is also a complex system and it has tipping points. And in fact, there's been some fascinating work showing where those tipping points might be, um, both observational and experimental studies. And they, uh, the recent ones all point to roughly a quarter of the population. That once you've got a quarter of the population committed to a new position, it becomes very difficult to resist. Um, and if you think of extraordinarily rapid changes that we've seen recently, for instance, um, the end of smoking in public places, you know, 40 years ago, it was just implausible. You know, no one would ever imagine that you, know, you wouldn't be in smoke-filled rooms everywhere. But... But then, you know, it, it flipped with extraordinary speed. Similarly, the acceptance of uh, marriage equality right across Western Europe. Um, again, it was, it was considered an abominable idea. You can't possibly have it. If, you, if civilization would come to an end, if gay people were allowed to marry. And suddenly it's like, well, of course, I've always, I've always believed that gay people were allowed to marry. You know, and after the war, everyone becomes a member of the resistance. Um, and, and what seems to happen in these cases is two things. First of all, it's the dynamics of the complex system we call society at work. But secondly, it's because we are these hyper-social mammals and we've always got our whiskers twitching to see which way the social wind is blowing. And if we perceive that the wind has changed, we do not want to be left behind. And, and, and people, for better or for worse, uh, very often for worse, side with the status quo. But if you can change the perception of what the status quo is, then you can change the whole of society. And, and this, these findings, are, I, I think, are very hopeful because it means you don't have to argue with your grumpy father-in-law in the opposite corner. You don't have to argue with your average Daily Mail reader. Uh, you don't have to persuade them. Um, you know, they will come along when when the rest of society has flipped, you know, and it's a very brave person today who'll stand up and say, I'm in favour of secondhand cigarette smoke. People should be allowed to smoke in restaurants. You know, it just, it, it doesn't happen anymore. You know, it, people just flip around, whatever their prior views were. 
and they will genuinely believe that they always thought what they think today. Uh, you know, you come across cases of this all the way. Well, I've always believed. <laughs> no, you haven't. But you know, don't <laughs> don't tell them because because you know they they'll change with society, and so so it's not nearly as hopeless as we think it is. You know, things things can happen, but you know, obviously we're starting from a very low base with issues like this. You know, very low information, very low understanding, very low penetration, very very low motivation as well to 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 make these changes, but. You know, things can happen fast. The, the big question always in my mind is, can we reach the social tipping points before we hit the environmental tipping points? Thank you, George. Sorry, I was on. I was talking on mute, which isn't terribly helpful. Um, Martin, you have your hand raised as well, so I think it'd be a good time to introduce you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Tony. And thank you, George. Um, I just want to go back to uh, Patrick's points about these, uh, the enemies of the systems approach that he referred to um, in, in relation to, to Churchman and, and George, your, your response about being intrigued by the aesthetics. I mean, there's one point I would like to make and, and there's one question as well. Um, the point about aesthetics, I think, is quite an interesting one when you come to think about the, the usefulness of systems thinking. A lot of people on this, uh, amongst this audience here, would see systems thinking in terms of being a conceptual um, art form rather than just merely a, a sort of a scientific um, method of, of, of capturing data and so forth. There is... Um, underpinning systems thinking there is this this uh, this this artisanal craft skill which actually lends itself in my mind's eye to um to providing that kind of aesthetic that that uh, i think you were alluding to george and and certainly i would uh, invite you to explore the various different ways in which um systems thinking does give expression to these boundaries that we are making and, and the use of viable system model has been referred to indirectly critical systems heuristics has been referred to as well but there is a, an underpinning art form there which i think has a lot of potential in serving that particular aspect one of the things that uh, the thing that the the enemy that that patrick didn't mention was was morals and morality um and there is so there's this thing about people's values, which is occupying this this domain of out there, if you like, um, which is very difficult to engage with. And one of the values, it seems to me, that's been diminished over the last um, the, la the last certainly the last ten years or so, has been the value that we put with experts. And again, George, you've you've, you've made reference to this indirectly. Um, my question to you is how is it that we might invite a more trusting attitude towards expertise from various different fields whether it's scientists or non-scientists but basically generally speaking there seems to be a a, um, a post-trust ethos or era that we're in now which goes far beyond just the, the post-truth um, uh, era that people refer to. And I'm just wondering, what, how is it that we can try to regain and establish that kind of trust, which, which is so important, it seems to me, in that, in that political engagement that, uh, the, that we're all looking for? Thank you, Martin. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm sure there's no easy answer to it. Um, I mean, one observation is is that this trust has not disappeared by itself. It has been deliberately undermined. I mean, I've been watching it for longer than most because um, I've seen it happening with climate issues for over 20 years now. Um, probably, uh, actually, I've been engaging in it about for about 25 years, fighting climate deniers 
And these climate deniers, you know, purported to be just ordinary citizens stumbling across the truth. And uh, invariably, they would turn out to be funded by Exxon, by Shell, by BP, by Chevron, by Texaco, by the coal companies, by the electricity companies. Uh, this has now been very well documented. But at, at, at the beginning, we were sort of thinking, who are these people? Why, why won't they accept what the scientists are saying? Why, what, what, what is it about them which, which is coming up with these completely bonkers unicorn narratives um and then later on you find oh yeah right they've been paid to say this stuff and and then of course they would attract genuine independent citizens who were who were saying oh yes i i i agree with what they're saying and and then it begins to snowball you know it, it's it's a classic astroturfing operation that you started off by creating a sort of fake grassroots uh rising and then it eventually turns into a genuine grassroots rising in this case against climate science but now we've seen the same you know against medical science you know against vaccination and against uh, against pandemic statistics or, or, or whatever people find inconvenient um, or whatever certain economic interests find inconvenient let's tear that down and it's very rapidly spreading to one area of expertise after another to the point at which um, when um, members of this government speak and they rail against elites, they're not talking about people like themselves against a the prime minister with, who's got six hundred million pounds worth of assets, um, or um, you know, all the billionaires who who, who fund who, who fund the Conservative Party. No, they're talking about anyone with a degree is now part of the elite, um, and and so suddenly very ordinary citizens with ordinary incomes they are the public enemy who are preventing other people from fulfilling their potential and this is a a a, a very um um uh, effective political strategy um deflecting public anger deflecting blame onto people who really bear no responsibility for for what's been going wrong but you know are are um, perceived to be privileged because they've got a university degree, are perceived to be different, are perceived to be thinking in a different way to those that um, demagogic politicians might, might be appealing to. Um, and that is a very dangerous situation. So it's not going to be solved merely by asking nicely, and it's not going to be solved merely by um, professionals communicating better. You know, if 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 you've got a political drive against expertise, and expertise becomes a weapon in the culture war, you know, you, you, when when you know the experts are up there with with all the other popular demons now being summoned up by the likes of Braverman and Lee Anderson and 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 the other culture warriors, um, Trump, of course, on the other side of the Atlantic, and many others like them, Orban, Erdogan. Um, uh, Modi, uh, you know, Bolsonaro, as was, you know, we 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 see this sort of global war now against expertise take, take, taking place, and we're going to have to come up with some novel strategies for for pushing that back. And I'm sorry to say, I don't yet know what those are. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, George. Um, I think probably we, we might just have time for one or two last comments or questions. Um, Arwen, I think you had a quick comment, and then I think Barbara put a question in the chat that I quite like to phrase as well. So can we go with you first, Arwen? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so I really appreciate this uh, conversation because I work um, at the interface of research on climate and agriculture and biodiversity and natural resource management. So everything you're saying, George, is ringing true. Um, and as a systems thinker, a lot of what we think about is how change happens and how you manage to move things from a niche to the regime and grow them, um, you know, when you have small uh, initiatives that have promise, how you manage to scale them up, how you manage to make them deeper, how you make, how, you know, how you make them go viral. Um, and a lot of that is creating stories, I think, stories of hope and optimism. Um, and, and I think we have a danger sometimes of being very bipolar, especially in the UK. I don't live in the UK and much of my work's in poorer countries. But, we, you know, it's like it's either pasture fed beef or it's industrialised. Well, there's a lot you can do with smallholder farming and circular economies and reducing consumption and reducing waste. And so just making that narrative a bit richer. 
And then also finding positive deviants. One thing that's really striking in the UK um, is that there isn't a food strategy for the UK. Mm. And Professor Tim Lang, I think is at UCL, he's written a lot about this, about you know what the food strategy was and then what it was after that and how now there just isn't one. And then Henry Dimbleby came up with one, was it last year? But then that wasn't listened to and that was taking into account the economy and the environment and the social aspects and feeding people. And you know, by all accounts, it was a jolly good strategy, but it never got a chance even to be looked at. So there are things that we can leverage and there's also initiatives springing up everywhere that we can get behind. So, for example, in about 90 countries around the world, chefs are standing up for the chef's manifesto and the chef's pledge and saying we want our food to be sustainably uh, resourced. So, you know, I think if we look, we can find those sustainability, uh, those sustainable initiatives and try and push them into from being into a niche into the regime. So I wanted to make a positive comment more than a question. Right. No, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, and there's definitely some some great people putting forward great proposals, which, uh, as you suggest, are very often fall on stony ground, to use a suitably agricultural metaphor. Thank you, Tara. Um, one last question, maybe just from Barbara, who uh, I think asked two questions, but I want to try and phrase the second one, which was that what role might um, institutions that the kind of science policy interface have in addressing some of that information deficit and helping move this transformation onwards. Yeah, so um, we, we have and have had some brilliant institutions working on, on that interface. I mean, the Climate Change Committee at the moment is, is, is a good example. We had the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which was I think one of the best of those agencies that had ever existed in this country, which got shut down by David Cameron. I still feel very bitter about that because it was, a, from, from a journalistic point of view, a fantastic source of analysis and information. Um, we, um, you know, every one of these institutes, these organisations which work on that interface um, has a really important role to play. I mean, arguably one of the most important roles of all which is trying to get scientific findings into public life. And uh, let's face it, public life is almost entirely dominated by humanities graduates. And I'm not saying they're the elite, they're the problem, because you know a, 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 there's a lot of absolutely brilliant humanities graduates trying to do great stuff, but we need more science graduates in public life. And I speak particularly from the experience of journalism, where there are very, very few science graduates. Um, uh, and if they are, there are, they're specialist science communicators. You know, you don't get science graduates in the newsroom. You don't get science graduates in 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 the documentary department. You know, unless they're making wildlife documentaries or science documentaries. But you know, not as not in terms of general programming. And as a result, there's a phenomenal lack of basic scientific knowledge. And it wasn't long ago I was um, um, having a conversation with a uh, researcher um, for a BBC program, and 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 I said and I said no no it's 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 two orders of magnitude worse than you're saying. She said what well, is twice as bad. Um, and there was another um, occasion recently where I had to explain what CO two was, and and it's you know th these are, are such basic concepts, but you know we we. And it's hard for people who, who who do have a scientific grounding to understand how little science, even people in very powerful positions, might know. And so transmitting that scientific knowledge and explaining it and and making it relevant and and making it colourful, um, so that so that people um, who don't have a scientific background might get attracted to it and interested in it and prepared to listen to it. This communication role is a really important one in every field, but it's never more important than when it comes to the existential threats that we and the rest of the living planet face. Thank you, George. Um, I think actually, uh, Pat Patrick just reminded me that, uh, that the thing that is worthwhile, it'd be really interesting to see what, how it works and how it feeds back into some of the issues that you raised. But we've now got the, the thing that we're trying to do on Go Science, which is Sire working with the 
Government Office of Science. So actually there's a systems science angle to this as well, isn't there? As well as all the other traditional sciences, all the STEM that people talk about. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to dash off to my next meeting, Tony, but right. it's been a Absolutely. great pleasure talking to you all. Thank you very much for hosting and me. George, thank you so much. And for people who would like to go and research, George's name links directly to, to your, your website on our website. So people can go and find out a bit more about your work and some of the issues you're in. Thank you ever so much for coming and speaking to us this evening. Thanks thank a lot, you. Tony. Lovely to meet you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.